All right, perfect. Thank you everyone again for joining the executive circle on how automation changes the growth game today. Um, for some of you, it's already the afternoon, so maybe even over your lunch break. Just wanted to um, go over what we were going to talk about today. First, um, just provide you an overview of, you know, kind of how we're looking at um, automation changing the growth game, go through the introductions, talk about the marketing automation progression model and the roadmap that uh, corresponds with that. Uh, get into our panel discussion and then we'll have a Q&A. Um, so when we get to the Q&A or throughout the sessions, if you do have any questions, if you want to go ahead and go into the chat and then push those to myself, Tracy Ellis, the lead host, um, we'll get um, through the end and then we'll go back and we'll circle back on those questions specifically. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we think is really important as we talk about um, you know, automation is how companies are leveraging it, especially after the last year to really get businesses back on track, but also really to help them accelerate and grow. And what we want to do today is give you the opportunity to just gain perspective on how to best invest, leverage, evolve and execute on those marketing automation initiatives and drive growth from those. So be able to execute, measure it, continue to, you know, change those dials that so you are constantly improving that performance and driving the growth. Um, we'll prepare for, you know, prepare, launch and illustrate results. Um, but more so than that, um, you'll not only have those things, but we want to talk about how you need to leverage people, process and technology and even patience um, in these initiatives with automation. And then at the end, we'll also provide the opportunity for you to have a complimentary um, overview assessments that you can build your own custom roadmap to how to evolve your marketing automation progression as you move forward as well for your company. So um, with that, um, let me jump in here. Myself, Tracy Ellis, I am the CEO at Leadist. We are a six plus year um, exclusive Marketo Engage partner of Adobe. Um, and you know, our whole goal is to meet clients where they're at in their marketing automation journeys and then be able to help them evolve that based on, you know, leveraging that people process and technology moving forward. So um, I'll be the moderator today and uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Melissa for an interview as well. Hey, thanks, Tracy. My name is Melissa Day. I'm the global digital marketing leader at Moore's. Uh, we are a chemical manufacturing company. Uh, we spun from DuPont about seven years ago now. Um, and we manufacture products you may have heard of, Teflon, Freon, Option. Uh, we have four major businesses. I support the digital marketing competency globally, uh, and we're using Marketo and Salesforce in our tech stack today. Awesome, awesome, thank you. And Cindy? Hi, good afternoon or good morning. Um, my name is Cindy Chun. I'm the Director of Sales for our commercial business within the Adobe umbrella. Uh, I cover the Southeast region and my team is um, here to basically support and help any of your uh, businesses uh, evaluate and look at how to do a solid digital transformation. Uh, Melissa has been a great advocate and just really being able to share her experience and we want to be able to support your efforts there. So um, excited to be here and I've got my team members on too um, if there's any questions that come up. Thank you, Cindy. All right. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do, and I understand that this is tiny, um, but it is available. Many of you actually requested it prior to the um, event today. We can also send it to you after. But really, this is what the marketing automation progression model looks like. For those of you familiar in the past, there was a Marketo marketing maturity curve. Um, and that is really this first kind of thick row that goes across um, under automation technology, right? What we really believe in how this is, has come to be is that it's not just a silver bullet when you use automation. You can't just turn it on and your company grows, right? Leads fall from the sky and you're super successful. There's a lot that goes into it. And so this again takes into consideration the automation technology, the process, which is supported by serious decisions, and then also um, the people, both you know yours and others, consultants, experts to come in to help you get the lift that you need. Um, and in this case, we actually sandwich together between what the business impact is that you would 
see in each one of these phases as well as the progress triggers. So when do you know that you're ready, you know, to evolve from phase one to phase two? Um, and so the thing that I also mentioned earlier was patience and it was brought to our attention that that really is also key, right? It, you have to have this on for a while. It has to be getting data. You have to be sending emails. You have to be connected to your channels and then leverage that data to be able to tell you what to do next. And so you don't just turn it on and it, works perfectly, right? There's things that need to happen over time. And so being patient, and we'll talk um, as well today about what that means and what we've experienced in some of those, um, those initiatives. Um, before we go, you know, any deeper into the model itself, I did, you know, want to just circle back with you, Cindy, and, and just ask one key question from a, you know, best in class provider of automation services being Adobe and, and Marketo Engage. What are, are there any key trends or, or things that you see are really important that are coming down the, the pike in this area that you could share with us? Um, yeah, Tracy. So we actually just completed our Adobe Summit uh, last month, and there were so many great just updates and releases. And I, th I think a lot of um, what we have heard out in the market was, hey, when we have a company that gets acquired by a larger company, maybe we don't invest and we don't innovate. But I think uh, our summit uh, has been a testament that Adobe has been investing. And so we've got new releases that just happened this month. Um, we've got a new UI. We've got tons of other things coming down on our roadmap from Adobe uh, Journey orchestration. And so we're really excited. Um, it hasn't been officially released yet for our, you know, potential Marketo customers, but we are super excited of all the innovation that is continually going to be uh, showcasing down the road. So um, we hope that everyone gets really interested and then hopefully look at our tool. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, so switching over, let's talk a little bit about, you know, it, it's great. in their story to, you know, give everybody a vantage point of, hey, I've gone through this, I've experienced the, you know, the, 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 the hiccups you can have and the challenges along the way, and I'm getting to success or I've had success. And so now I've, you know, added on additional things to help me um, evolve. And so, Melissa, of course, I have a few questions for you and probably a lot. Um, but when you see this marketing automation progression model and kind of where you guys, where you started and, and kind of where you're at now, can you give a high level overview of what you've experienced thus far? Sure. I mean, I've been in Marketo for 10 years. I'm a Marketo champ this year. So I have different, different feelings about the chart, about Marketo in general and, and where we stand, depending on kind of what portion of, of that time uh, we're talking about. When I started at Camores about four years ago, um, we we would have been in in the early part of, of phase one, and I think uh, this chart didn't scare me, but a chart like this would have scared anyone that I I would have tried to talk to about about our instance. We were still really go, going through this growth curve of what is marketing automation and how can it help us and 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 what should we be doing with Marketo and what even is it? And I have conversations today sometimes from course I had a conversation this morning with someone who didn't know that the forms on our website were Marketo forms and then explaining you know what Marketo is and, and what it does um, so I, I think it's it all depends on who you're talking to and, and in what context um, I think it's amazing where we are today is is rounding out phase two headed into phase three and this has been such a helpful outline right it's a it's a challenge of accountability it forces you to audit where you are and really take stock of what foundational elements you really need to make sure you have in place before you move on. It gives you this great sense of a roadmap and a goal to move towards. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so a few more questions. Um, when you, you know, obviously the, the technology itself, right, that is going to be unique to everybody as far as which features they're using and when they're using those and why. Um, but let's talk about people for, for a minute. You talked a little bit about conversations that you have and you know you have to kind of bridge the gap between this is this progression model and you look at it and it automatically makes sense to you. And there's a lot of people that you're doing a lot of explaining for. 
how do you lead your team through initiatives like this when there's a lot of people outside of that marketing organization or that ops organization that that people have that don't necessarily understand digital transformation or or what the process is behind the result that you're trying to get them to it's, that's such a great question and and there's no there's no real big secret i think the answer to a lot of those conversations is education but also understanding your audience and where to, where to start. It's not very different from what you do in marketing to your audience, right? Figure out how do you take people through a customer journey? How do you start someone off in an awareness stage, right? How do you get them used to your brand, get them used to your product offerings? This is very similar. Um, and what, what I always find to be very interesting in at Comore specifically is we work with a lot of people who know the science, who know the chemistry, who know the engineering. I can tell you about our products and the features and the benefits. And there are times that I'm on phone calls and I don't understand half of what anyone's talking about because they're talking about the chemical compounds that are creating our products. And sometimes the world that I live in is very similar. And it's about understanding who you're talking to, what level of appetite they have for what you're trying to share, and changing your message to make sure you're getting to the point of what that person cares for. Um, and in that example where someone's talking about chemical molecules and compounds and, and research and development. I'll be the first one to say, I, I think you're great, but this doesn't make sense to me. What is, it, what is it that you need me to know? What are you trying to tell me? Are you trying to tell me that makes our product better? Are you trying to tell me that there's a certain proof point that we need to include in our messaging? Why does this matter to me? And so I try to do the same courtesy depending on who I'm talking to. What do they care about? I think the new features that Cindy's talking about in Marketo are incredible but I have to know my audience and some people who I talk to within my organization aren't gonna understand what I'm talking about. So I have the people I can geek out with and then I have people who, let me try to filter this message so that I can talk to you about what matters to you only and just you know, maintain that bubble in a sense. And what has been your story at um, with Shamars, what has, what has been the story that you tell people about what you guys have done? We really started in a place where digital marketing was a, a competency that, that was not very well known. We're a B2B manufacturing company. We've been selling to the, even though we're a new company, we have old roots, you know, spinning from DuPont. So we've been selling to the same people forever. There was not a lot of reason for digital marketing, period. You know, in, as far as our senior leadership was concerned for a point in time, let alone, you know, marketing automation. So it's really been a journey of, hey, let's talk about what generating a lead could look like. Let's talk about what that means. Let's talk about what could that value be for the company. And once we get to that point, OK, I'm, we're starting to see people understanding why leads can be important, why having fresh content to show them for them to engage with is important. Now let's talk about, well, wouldn't it be great to segment them based on data? And then once we get past that, wouldn't it be great if we could tell you know, how engaged they are based on a point system? And now we start talking about lead scoring. And so it's really been you know, small chunks at a time, really similar to the, the, the phase approach of the progression model to show, okay, now that we've mastered this concept, let's talk about the next one. Let's talk about advancing to the next stage. And we're finally at a point now where four years ago, I sat in a boardroom meeting that no one wanted to hear about leads. Leads didn't matter. We know everybody that buys our products. We don't need leads. And, uh, and this year, we are at the point where we have marketing goals directly um, attributed to marketing qualified leads. We've never had marketing qualified leads before. We've never tracked them. We've never held ourselves accountable to create them. We've really been focused on brand awareness and impressions in terms of metrics, and we're challenging ourselves to, to really connect marketing to revenue dollars, um, which is, is really a huge advancement for us. And wouldn't be possible without Marketo, without you know, progressing through our growth model. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, what is your best um, tip for user adoption? Like the people and the team that supports you, like what is, what do you think the thing that like kind of got them over the hump or onto, onto the initiative and kind of backing what you were trying to do? I think the bubble is so important. And it's not because we're, I'm working with people who can't handle all of the information. That's not to say that it's, it's a safety bubble 
or that it's this bubble of ignorance, but it's, it's understanding that there's so much complexity here. And if we can get people involved through a bit of a breadcrumb trail, it's just little digestible pieces at a time, eventually you end up in a place where you have someone who's done enough that they feel comfortable in the tool or they feel comfortable talking about the tool and they can, they can continue to advance with you. But for example, we have the organization I sit in is actually um, the global function. We support all of the businesses globally. We're a centralized marketing communications group. And each of our businesses have decentralized marketing and sales teams. So we're all busy all the time. And we all have, you know, so much support that, that we're supposed to be giving. And I try to, to really react to whatever one of uh, my team members is going through from a marketing communications perspective. If we have a webinar coming up and they're asking, you know, I want to send an invitation out that looks like this. What a great opportunity for me to talk to you about dynamic content in Marketo. What a great opportunity for me to show you what we can actually do with the templates. And do you want to log in and try this yourself and just play around putting copy and in the different WYSIWYG components in the email? You don't have to send it, just build it, see what you think. And all of a sudden they're in. And for this one very particular reason, and we're not talking about forms, we're not talking about life cycle stages, we're not talking about scoring, we're just we're talking about an email. Why are you gonna write copy in a Word doc and give it to somebody else to put in there? You can do it, you can see what it looks like. You can add the images you're talking about. Why don't you get a feel for it? I know you can do it. And it's taking those chunks. And then a couple of weeks later, it's remember that webinar invitation you built? Let me show you how easy it is to send it. Let me show you how easy it is to build the drip email for your, you know, for the people who attended your webinar. Let me show you how easy it is to put them in a Salesforce campaign from here. And it's picking and choosing the timing that you're sharing with people, the capabilities and the, the training of how to based on when it's most relevant. Awesome. Awesome. So looking at the progression model, where do you feel, um, where do you feel is like the most pivotal point on the progression model for companies? I think the most pivotal is phase one is really building out the foundational aspects. You know, mm -hmm. once you get past the proof point of phase zero, um, which I think if you've already invested in trying out the tool, you're invested enough to get past phase zero. You're, you're, you're excited. This is a checklist of like, hey, we're ready to get started. It's so easy to get lost in phase one. It's easy to look ahead and peek ahead to the purple at the end of phase four and be like, well, I, I want to do that. I want to do behavioral segmentation. Do global, global omni-channel attribution, right? <laughs> Who doesn't want to do that? But you can't right. because you're in phase one. And first you have to get through some of the basics. So that's the most pivotal point because if you start looking too far ahead and trying to build out for things that you're not ready for, you miss some of the crucial elements and you're never actually ready to really in a scalable way manage the tactics that have caught your eye that are really meant for someone further in. It could give you a completely wrong idea of what the tool is actually meant to do and put you into situations of struggle that you wouldn't have been in otherwise. So why isn't this working? Why can't we just? Well, because some of the basics didn't get covered. So phase one is, is not as shiny, not as exciting, and it also comes with the user adoption piece, even for yourself as the owner of the tool. If you've never been in Marketo or if you haven't been in it at, at the company that you're with currently, it's getting through all of these growing pains of, well, how do we want to set it up? There's so many options and there's so much to customize. And, you know, what are some of the basics? What are some of the basic process decisions that we want to make? You have to get through that point. And then once you're past it, I think channeling through phase two, phase three become a little bit easier. You're using the framework that you developed in phase one to keep yourself moving and you have some momentum. Awesome. Awesome. So that's kind of pivotal in regards to what phase you're at. As far as the actual foundational layers here that are all built into the progression model, which, um, you know, kind of row across do you feel is the most pivotal? Oh, I mean, I'm biased. That too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm biased to automation. I think, I think that is so pivotal. It's just, it's really structuring your operational model. Um, so th that's, that's where I always start, um, is making sure that you have your house in order, so to speak, and your house being that source of truth in, in Marketo, in this instance, what we're talking about today. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Um, 
so a couple more questions and then I want to turn it over to um, Q&A at the, the half hour mark. Um, what do you feel or, or what, what has been the most challenging piece of you guys getting this, you know, operationally and moving forward for Shamars? A, a couple of things. It's hard to pick the most challenging because depending on the day and the mindset, the challenges can kind of vary in weight. I think we've had, we've had a challenge of needing to get people on board with the concept of leveraging marketing automation to its fullest capability, which is, which can be hard to do if you're not talking to people who understand, you know, the potential inside of the tool, um, let alone the potential of a lead, right? So that's one challenge more on uh, this, this campaign trail kind of aside. Um, and that was a lot of the struggle that we went through. Then there's also the operational challenge. You know, once, once you do figure out what it is that you want to set out to do, and, and these checklist items are great. You want to do, you know, database segmentation. Great. How, what data, what segments, like you can, you can build it. That's a great idea, but but what's, what are the, what are your end goals and how do you define those business requirements? And then how do you take those business requirements to track back and say, how do I make sure that the technology is going to give me what I need at that end goal? It's a little bit of translation work on both sides, trying to translate out the, the need to use the technology and then trying to translate backwards and collect the information on the business side of what ultimately they want to do to figure out how, how you build that in an operational way. Um, it's, even though it's the biggest challenge, it's my favorite place to be. It's been my favorite place to be for the last 10 years of this very gray area in between an administrator in the tool and knowing all the ins and outs of the technical capabilities of Marketo, but being dangerous enough to understand how you would use the capabilities. And that skill set is so important. I may be the only person at Comores that has that particular skill set that can live in in both sides but you only need one person you only need one person to serve on both sides you can have people that understand the ins and outs of the marketing automation tool and you can have people that understand the business but you need at least one person who knows how to translate it back and forth or you have people speaking different languages and you have a lot of unhappy people at the end of the day awesome awesome that was an awesome response um, so before we switch it over to Q&A, my favorite question that I always ask moderating any kind of a panel is, what is your favorite story? Um, and in this case, what is your favorite story that relates back to marketing automation or your use of Marketo in Comores? My favorite story. Oh, man. I have, I, I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of good stories, I think, a lot of that are meaningful to me. I think one of... <laughs> One of the worst stories um, that has is funny today was just um, when I first started just trying to figure out what was going on inside of our instance of Marketo. Um, it was an instance that I inherited from someone who had left the company and left the state and like moved away, hopefully not because of Pumors or because of Marketo, but they were gone, like no contact. So I had to jump in and just figure out what like what was going on and and for a long time it was just keep the lights on and we had emails to send out and we had things that we had to do and one way or another i built something wrong <laughs> it, was, it had to be just within my first month that i was there and i built something inside of marketo to send an email that should have been simple like one of the first check boxes in the, your automation row in phase one um and it accidentally went out to like our entire database in Spanish, it was for a very particular, very small group of people it was meant for, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> went out to everybody. And it was how I ended up meeting a lot of people at Comores because I got this flood of email from sales and marketing resources. Like my customer told me that they just got this email in Spanish about a product that they've never heard of before. Do you know anything about this? Like, oh, let me tell you about Marketo. <laughs> and also, I'm so sorry. Yeah, <laughs> it was, uh, it, it was terrible. It was, it was one of the most embarrassing things. Um, but <laughs> it was just, it was funny to, to kind of see, even knowing as much as I knew about the tool that mistakes can happen. And, and it's so important to what I should have done is gone through and done a better audit and figure out really, you know, where we were and what some of the capabilities were before mm -hmm. trying to just go and use it. 
Yeah. And that's a, that's great though. Cause I think even all of us, even in our personal, you know, emails, these huge brands will send out an email and then they, you get like an oops email, you know, <laughs> a little bit afterwards, like, Oh, just kidding. That is not on sale for a dollar. Like, you know, so it's like, it's interesting that, you know, kind of having one of those errors and experience that it makes it a little bit more real, especially when you have people underneath you that, you know, as you've grown out your team, like they're probably going to, you know, make a mistake too. So um, definitely a great spot that you can be into where you can laugh at it, um, you know, a while, a while later. Um, oh, yeah, so a while um, later. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're starting to get a few questions. So if people want to continue to, um, you know, message me directly on the chat, um, I will just go through and start to, um, ask some of the questions. And then I actually have the different um, layers of the progression model um, listed out here. And so depending upon what we're talking about, I'll just go into them a little bit, um, a little bit deeper so that we can see that. Um, but just before I take this first Q&A, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to share, you know, this growth um, through the lead funnel um, that you said that you've been using internally to help kind of simplify and explain Marketo on one slide and what you're doing, depending upon you know, who you might talk to. So can you just give us an overview of how you leverage this? Absolutely. Maybe building the slide was the biggest challenge. This took forever <laughs> to try to take everything that was in my brain and everything that was on my whiteboard and, and that we talked about with my team and figure out how do we fit it into one slide and, and talk about our story. Um, and the details here really aren't as important as what you'll notice is there's no mention of Marketo. There's no mention of revenue cycle model. There's no mention of, I don't even think we talk about like, we don't call it life cycle stages. We don't really talk about lead scoring. We, we wanted to conceptualize in, in a more tangible way, something that is so inherently intangible. It, when you're talking to a group of people who have literally never heard of the concept of lead scoring, you can't start with that. You can't go in and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking for a set of behavioral and demographic you know, point values, because it's not going to mean anything. So where do you start? You have to go back to the beginning and kind of ground yourselves in, in number one, a language that you agree on. This is how we're referring to prospects that we generate. This is how we're referring to leads. This is the point at which we're marking them as being qualified. So really laying the framework there. We also leverage this to talk about clarity and roles and responsibility. So within our organization, our marketing communications group that I'm a part of, that, that centralized function, we are responsible for the channel strategy. So really outlining that as, as the job here is to determine who marketing wants to go after, who sales wants to talk to, finding where they are, and we have our own methods of doing that. We're not putting the whole world on the slide, but but we're figuring out you know, what those right channels are and they're feeding the funnel. So making sure that we're outlining that part, that's, that's marketing communications. And once we get them to come in, the, the numbers are getting smaller and people are falling out and that's okay. We're, we're holding on to the people who are the most engaged, who are the most qualified, the people who we care about the most. And at the bottom, that's where you see that, that clarity change from marketing to sales. This is where we want sales to review and sales to follow up is right in the middle of that funnel. And then we want ultimately a business opportunity to be created. Nothing is at this point is hard and fast. We're not talking about the exact you know, detail that needs to be involved to determine you know, at what point you open an opportunity, which you could never put into one slide. I don't know a single company who could say, this is the moment that you create an opportunity on one slide, but just introducing the, the idea of creating an opportunity based on the lead that came from marketing that was new to us. So just presenting it in that way and really punctuating it with why are we structuring things this way? What are some of the goals? This is the slide that I go back to in every meeting that I have, even if I'm talking to people who have heard the lead scoring message, even if I'm talking to people who are already familiar with the way that we are passing leads over from marketing to sales in Salesforce. This is, this is the, the ground yourself slide. This is what it all points back to. So as long as everything that we're doing connects back here, I can make a use case either way. I can start here and say, because we agreed that this is the model of how we wanna be managing our operations, we need you know, XYZ capability to make this happen. 
and vice versa. We're introducing this capability because it connects back with this, you know, stage transition or, you know, because it's the way that we're going to track which channel strategy is performing better than the other. That's the latest conversation is marketing attribution. What does a multi-touch marketing attribution model mean? Let's, let's start at this slide. It goes back to being able to track what channels in our channel strategy, right, brought in people, what, what they connected with. Everything comes back here. It's just the most universal slide. And so it's become the most crucial part um, of all of those conversations, regardless of who I'm talking to. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so I'm just going to back up here. We have our first question um, in regards to the progression model. And the first question is on business impact, um, which is the results, um, you know, row or, or kind of foundational layer on the model itself. And the question is, when you started, where, what metrics did you start to track? You know, when you were in phase zero, were you tracking metrics? And then in phase being, you know, moving from phase one to phase two, what metrics did you track? We tracked a lot of campaign based metrics in the beginning. We were doing a lot of awareness metrics, a lot of like the vanity metrics as, as, as they're kind of being called today. Like, you know, how, like how many people saw our ad, how many people clicked on our ad. And it was, it was very based on those silos of what ad we were running, what channel it was running on. Um, and then some of the other glamour metrics of, you know, email engagement performance, but all very much limited to the activity, like whatever the one activity was that, that we were talking about. Over the course of time, we were able to grow that to be able to say, well, let's see that data, but based on this group of people. And so we started kind of transitioning it from activity to a person. Um, and more of where we are today in determining business impact is, is that same slide that you just showed, we're looking at it from a funnel metric perspective to be able to understand what touch points are helping to facilitate the movement of someone from the start of the funnel through wherever they are today. You know, what, um, you know, what activity or what level of engagement are we seeing giving the most people the highest amount in terms of lead score? What channel are we seeing that's, you know, creating the most prospects who are finding their way to an MQL? So we're really leveraging the data uh, that we're collecting in a new way today to manipulate it in all kinds of ways to make decisions about what we do next. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so the next um, series of questions, um, there's actually quite a few of them, actually relate to the technology you know, kind of row. So this is obviously a, a big one. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the marketing automation maturity curve that Marketo had done years even before Adobe, um, you know, had acquired them was really based on this first top row, Adobe Marketo. What we feel is really important as you look to, you know, leverage your MarTech stack is that it's not just Marketo, it's also other technology partners, right? So like what other technology partners are you using? You know, what CRM are you connected to? Do you have an ABM partner? you know, your analytics partners, et cetera. And then also a lot of times internally, depending upon how big and or sophisticated the company is, there's a lot of custom integrations as well that, you know, you need to get data from somehow into your, your marketing automation to, to execute. Um, but the question specifically is um, looking at phase one, do you feel that all of those um, check boxes need to be you know, checked off as far as a roadmap before you can move to phase two, or do you have things already checked across the phases and you're just trying to kind of go back and make sure that you more, you know, and I'm kind of paraphrasing their question, like you more specifically check off everything as you go back. Like maybe you have to address something further out, but you now have to, you know, hey, we have to go back and kind of finish up this thing and make sure that's tight before we really get into that next phase. I, that's such a hard question to answer just on, on the surface of, you know, like one answer to, to dictate everything. I think there will always be cases where you're kind of sprinkled check marks across the phases, but still consider yourself in phase one, even though you, you know, you may happen to be doing, uh, you know, email trigger campaigns in phase two. I think the difference is if you have, you know, five of the items checked off in phase one plus email trigger campaigns in phase two. You're not in phase two. You can't say that you're in phase two because that one piece is checked off, right? I think that's the point. You're in phase one. 
and you're working towards phase two and you may be leveraging one of the capabilities that is really more geared for phase two, having that level of understanding too, of maybe challenging yourself to ask, why are we doing something in phase two while we're in phase one? And why is this item in phase two and not phase one? So really having an understanding of what you might be missing. It's so much deeper than check marks, right? Um, mm -hmm. Even though they're so important to audit yourself. I, all of that being said, there's always going to be the case where, you know, even if you look into the bottom of the technology partners, you're not going to check off Salesforce integration and Dynamics integration and CRM integration, right? Mm -hmm. you, you might check one. Maybe you don't have a CRM and you don't check off any. And I don't think that prevents you from moving into phase two and completing that. It's really about understanding your use case, why you're leveraging these capabilities, why you may not be leveraging others. And if the answer is because we don't have a need for it or we don't have the supporting technology for it versus we're not ready for it, I think that better answers you know, where you really are. Awesome. Um, the next question is in regards to your overall MarTech stack, um, you had mentioned Marketo and Salesforce. Mm -hmm. um, the question is what other technologies have you connected together um, to leverage a more holistic view? So at Comores, we leverage Marketo and Salesforce. Um, we're leveraging Google Data Studio for a lot of our data visualization. Um, and so we're pulling in directly from Google Analytics and Google AdWords to get a better view of, of all of our data. And we're pulling Marketo data through an API into that. So we have this like really beautiful dashboard view of everything that's going on. Um, we're, we're not leveraging a ton of other technology um, we have Marketo Forms embedded onto our web pages, but we don't have an integration between like our CMS and our Marketo outside of that. Um, so we're, we're pretty simplistic on the technology side uh, for Comores in terms of what tools we're leveraging and what's in our stack. In general, in the past, I've worked with uh, different companies and different clients who have had all different variations. And you can, you know, you can link Marketo to dynamic CRM. You can link Marketo to Sugar CRM and you can really customize what that looks like. Um, we, you know, you can also be leveraging account-based marketing platforms, a demand base, or, you know, like whatever's out there, Terminus, there's, there's so many options. And if there is an integration that's offered, I think you're always better off trying to find a way to make that connection because you only gain insight and data and capability from keeping your tools stacked together as neatly as you can. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, on that note, I just realized we do also have like a webinar platform at Comores that we have integrated, um, you know, leveraging GoToWebinar or On24 or one of those, you know, virtual experience platforms. When you can build that connection, it allows you to do things that you couldn't do otherwise. Um, a good example of that, right? We couldn't send trigger based emails to people who register for our webinar if we didn't have our webinar system integrated with Marketo. And so there is a little bit of that dependency um, to fully check off the item in phase two of your progression model without that integration in place. Awesome, awesome. And just a, a question that I have, when you look at this as to where you're at, is there a check mark on here that like really excites you? Like, I can't wait till Camorras gets to this. Like either you haven't done this before or you feel like it's gonna be like game changing for what you guys are doing. Would you pick anything specific on here? Uh, advanced nurturing has had my eye since, uh, since I first saw this model. That's gonna be like the biggest check mark that I ever check off in any box because it's going to bring so much to us and so many people that I, that I work with talk about wanting it without using those words. We have so many conversations like, I just wanna to try to figure out how to get my content in front of people, but I don't really know who they are and I don't wanna pass them to a salesperson, but they've already engaged with us. Like that's, but you're talking about advanced nurturing, you just don't know that you're talking about it. And if we could just get the building blocks in place, we could enable it. If we could just get some of that content, you know, out of your head and into, you know, an email program, we could just fire something like that off. So that's, that's kind of where we are right now. Awesome. Um, so this slide here talks about the process and one of the questions that um, you've received in regards to the slide that you've put together and, and shared and this is, you know, as far as alignment, did you guys use a serious decisions type format to help get alignment between sales and marketing or was it just something one off that you did within Comores? 
Oh, that's that's a good question. This was this was really something that we just did within Comores, and it was something um, we suffered a lot, to be perfectly transparent, from a lack of accountability. And I know I've talked about accountability a lot in my answers. Maybe that's why there's there's a lot of um, well, I don't really want to touch that over here. Right. So when we talk about the value of the lead, uh, and I started that conversation four years ago, there was some pushback. Uh, well, I don't know that I really care about it. And it's not, you know, they're not really mine anyway. It's not really my place, so it doesn't matter. So, okay, so who, so who's our the leads? Who, who owns that territory? And nobody wanted it. Okay, I'll take it. Who wants, you know, what we do with them? Who's, who's dictating what happens to the leads? I don't know. Okay, well, I'll take that too. So as I've gone and had these conversations and nobody wants to take ownership, probably because we didn't have any process in place. So it was nothing too great to take ownership of. It was just a big challenge. Um, it ended up falling into my lap. It may be a little bit of a unique situation for Comores, but I didn't have a marketing organization saying, we, our goals are to generate X amount of traffic or to get in front of, you know, this many people or this, this type of person and sales saying our goal is to sell to this many people. And they were having a difficult time coming together. They're just, none of that was happening. Sales was completely doing their own thing. Marketing was completely doing their own thing. And within marketing communications, which is where I sit with operations and just digital marketing as a competency, we were just in a very reactive state waiting for people to come to us and say, well, we've decided that we want to get in front of this audience. Can you make us a landing page? Nope, it doesn't need to do anything. Don't connect it anywhere. Don't, you don't have to put it in Salesforce. No one just, can you just build it for us? And we really got tired of that model. So we took ownership of, this is what those digital channels are going to mean. Every landing page is going to be connected to a Salesforce campaign. Every prospect that gets generated is going to be scored. And if they score high enough, they're going to be passed to a salesperson. And the expectation is that you're going to follow up. So in this, maybe somewhat of a unique example, my team took ownership of a space that nobody wanted, that didn't exist. And after four years of fighting said, this is what it's going to look like. This is what we're building. We're going to train you on it. We're going to show you how it works. It's going to be great. We're going to generate all the qualified leads for you to call and we're going to report out on it and have data that we've never had before to make decisions that we could never make, you know, based on actual insights before. Um, and we got a lot of positive feedback owning the space that no one really knew existed. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so the next um, question is around people and the question is how big is your team? Uh, so my team fluctuates. It depends on uh, like FTEs and I have contractors in place and we also have a series of agency partners that we work with as well to help build out some of the digital marketing creative. And we have some operational consultants in place as well on the agency side who are helping us to facilitate, you know, all of the operational work in Marketo. Um, so it depends on how you look at it. I would say that uh, our team in terms of in-house comores is, is pretty small but mighty. There's about three of us, four of us. Um, on the marketing communications side, we have about a dozen marketing communication consultants that each represent a particular brand or represent a particular region. Um, and we work really closely together on the connection between what they're focused on in their specific brand or their region to what they need digitally to accomplish that. Okay. Um, another question is how much training have you had in automation? Like, and I'm guessing this question means like actual like training courses or certifications and things like that. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. Let me, let me think about that for a minute. Um, I, I actually went through the program at the digital marketing Institute and got my diploma there when I, when I was first starting, um, like 10 years ago and just learning more about the basics. And so they started to uncover a little bit of automation. Um, and then shortly after that, I got um, certified in the inbound methodology through HubSpot. It was easy, it was free. It was less about HubSpot, the tool specifically, and more just about inbound marketing in general and what's possible. Um, so that, that's, I still think, a great place to start, even if you're not using HubSpot at all. Because uh, it talks about SEO. It talks about the integration of nurture and triggers kind of in an unbiased way. 
Um, and then from there, I was in Pardot. I got certified in Pardot. Um, I got certified in Marketo probably around the same time, um, which was harder to learn. Marketo was, I think, the hardest one, um, but because it can do the most. Um, and then the last certification that I got was in Salesforce, um, just through the training in their Trailblazer community. Uh, I think I studied, I got the demand-based ABM certification a few years ago after going through the, that module. So it's, it's not a prescription. Don't feel like you have to go get all the certifications that I just talked about. But I was really trying to just stay on top of whatever was the most important or the most relevant for me at the time, not having the certification just to have it, but leveraging the opportunity to take part in a training that could teach me something new or teach me a new way to think about things. Um, it's great to know how to use certain tools, but it's also great to try to pull the value of all of these different, you know, um, knowledge centers that are available, kind of regardless of what tool it's really supporting. There are things that you can learn from the way that Pardot sets up engagement programs that you may be able to leverage some of the methodology there, you know, in your Marketo engagement program, for example. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the next thing that I want to do is shift a little bit toward patience, right? And kind of how long this takes. But before I do that, I just want to share a story that we had with a client. Um, so we were going over this, um, you know, progression model with a client and they were super excited to just have the opportunity to sit down and build their roadmap. And as we went through this, their CMO just had this, you know, just shocked look on their face. And, you know, the, you know, he kept saying, my dots are just spread so far apart. Like my dots are just spread so far apart. And I said, well, you know, part of it is get your, you know, check marks. And I think they were like filling it in like a scantron. So it looked like little circles. Um, I said, you know, there's two options. You can either see these, you know, as stars and like a vision that you may never get to in another galaxy that seems impossible, or you can connect the dots and come up with, you know, a, a unicorn and it could be like the greatest thing in your, you know, marketing career. So that's what I always say, like, are you going to connect the dots and make a unicorn or right now is it just still like a vision and you're just trying to, you know, a bunch of things throughout it. So just a cute little um, analogy to share. Um, but when we talk about, you know, patience, right. And we think about, yeah, there's all these things that need to happen. Like even in your, you know, career, you just talked about 10 years that spanned all kinds of training and different experiences that you had. I mean, patience and in, in getting up to this is one thing that I think is really, really key. Um, how long has it taken you guys to, you know, or you since you first, you know, adopted this instance of Marketo from someone else and kind of got it on the rails and really got it moving forward? How long has that taken? Uh, well, I, that's, I mean, it's a little bit of a loaded question because the, it's taken four years to get where we are right now and we're not done. So I don't know. I could, I could be in here for 10 more years and I, you know, we could check all the boxes on your chart and I would still hope that there was more to come. I think it's so great to have goals along the way, but not to get distracted thinking that there's some kind of end point when you're finished. Um, you know, and, and I think, I think Cindy would agree just even in the sense of there being new product offerings that are coming. There's checkboxes not on your chart today that may need to be there two years from now based on what new features may be coming out and the new way to manage your data. And, you know, we're all going to be holograms in 20 years, who knows, but like whatever that looks like, it's just this ongoing maturity. It's, it's, I think where the patience comes in is having the patience with yourself to really be honest and be able to tell where you are and take account for um, what you may be missing and, and where you want to grow right now in addition to where you want to grow over time and, and what a loftier end goal looks like. Um, and then having patience for me, having patience with everyone who I needed to really communicate with and, and get on board, um, not, losing, not losing sight of the end goal not losing the motivation to keep trying to talk to people who already told me that they didn't think leads were important to try to, to challenge that message. And well, like, well, what about in this context? Well, what about it now that the market looks like this? Well, what about leads now that our business has changed to support this strategy instead of this strategy? So really just staying, um, staying, staying hungry, I guess. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. 
So some of the you know, comments that we've heard as we've gone through this and, and gone through these assessments with Adobe with clients is that you know, trying to explain to people that marketing automation, it's an initiative, it's not a task. It's not something you do and just check it off. So to your point, like there's some things that you know, you're still getting to, right? It's a, it's a process. Um, I think setting realistic goals. So if the goal is, you know, I'm going to get automation and I'm going to turn it on and within the first three months, I'm going to have, you know, you know, have this all, you know, attributed back and I can show where my revenue is coming from. Like, I don't even think that that gives people the opportunity to get the system going enough. So you have enough data to start to analyze, to make some of those, um, you know, conclusions. Um, and then we always say, you know, analyze often, and I would connect that to iterate, right? So analyze often. So every time you send out a campaign or every time you, you know, launch with a new channel, take another look at it and see, you know, hey, this has been running for a while. What is the data telling me and what can I do different to constantly adjust my dials, you know, adjust my levers and try to get that constant improvement. Um, but the interesting thing is that you know, being transparent and sharing the story. And that's kind of how we started the conversation with you was, you know, how can I tell this story so that I can get other people excited about automation? Um, and I'm, you know, like you said, you know, being transparent with the story you shared that you sent out this, you know, email written in Spanish to people that weren't supposed <laughs> to get it and be like, ah, oh, transparent, like, ah, oh, that actually happened. But hey, let me, you know, use it as a reason to talk about Marketo. Have there been any conversations that you've had internally where, you know, you can say that maybe there is a, a lack of transparency and by sharing what it is that you were doing, it got more people on board. Can you give a specific example of something like that? Oh, absolutely. And that happens all the time. It's, it's a very fine line between that bubble and keeping people out from knowing, you know, so much that it could push them away to inviting them in and letting that bubble grow a little bit larger so that they can make better decisions. Um, that's been, that's been a huge curve for us. Previous to the role that I'm in now and the way that our team looks like, when I first started at Comores about four years ago, we had an internal agency model. Um, and I was managing our instance of Marketo, but the way that we were designed was more like receiving tickets. So we would hear from marketing or sales within the businesses to, to order from us. You hey, were going to a trade show, we needed a landing page, a thank you page, a forum, an email, whatever. That's coming from people who are not in Marketo and, and maybe don't even fully understand what those things mean. And a huge transition that, that we went through, uh, and I was trying to lead us through in the most great, graceful way possible, was eliminating the internal agency model and owning digital marketing as a competency to be shared and trying to get more involved in the strategy side as ideas were being conceptualized and campaigns were being created. On the flip side, even for people who don't have access to Marketo, showing them just enough under the hood to be able to say, you know, we can do this. Would this interest you? We can leverage dynamic content. Do you have any reason to be using that today? And trying to almost like sneak a peek at, at some of the features just to get people's brains going. And even if at the time that I was showing people in the marketing or the sales organization, did you know you could do this? Did you know that, you know, we could, we could take any action realistically under the sun that we want based on someone filling out a form? Have you ever seen it in this use case? Have you ever seen this get used? Oh, check out this case study of what somebody else just did. That's a really cool story from Marketo. Even if in that moment, the answer was like, oh yeah, okay. My phone would ring three weeks later. Hey, remember that thing that you were talking about? Something just came up and it feels like something that we should be able to do here. And all of a sudden, I, there were more conversations had and my calendar got busier and there were more opportunities to go in and say, Yes, we can accomplish something like this. Yes, Marketo is built to do something like this. Um, and so part of the idea was just getting in front of the people who were making the marketing planning decisions to let them know that there was a tool that we had in-house that could do so much that, that they just needed to plug in. They just needed to plug in the right people. They just needed to leverage the right process to really unlock some of the technology. Awesome, awesome. I always, you know, one of the things that I do in addition to, you know, running and, and being the leader at uh, Leadus is a lot of just, you know, mentoring and, you know, speaking to other, you know, leaders about just experiences and how to help people, you know, grow in their careers. And one of the things whenever I talk to marketers is that a lot of people are like, you know, I don't have a seat at the table, right? Like I just get kind of told what I, you know, want to do. And I always say back, you know, you either, 
have a seat at the table or you're getting eaten at the table, right? And it seems like marketing is one of the things that will get eaten the fastest, right? It's like you're a cost center, you know, you're you're out. You guys got eaten up like there's not, you know, room here. So I think that this is the first time having, you know, a CRM and a marketing automation platform tied together, you can really tell a great story. You can use amazing data points and KPIs and metrics you can show improvement on from one you know, period of time to a next, whatever that might be, to actually get that seat at the table, to be able to show, hey, here's how marketing is changing, how we're doing things for our company. Here's how we're helping our company grow and not just by the volume of the leads, but when you get to the point that you can attribute that revenue to it and say, this is the number of opportunities that our marketing efforts you know, built into our pipeline and here's the dollar value to that, right? Um, being able to, to have that conversation definitely gets organizations to the point where growth is you know, inherent and you do have that seat at the table. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of today's conversation was talking about how we leverage automation to grow. And in closing, do you have any, you know, kind of final, you know, comment on really where you've seen the most growth um, with how you guys have been um, responding to implementing more and more automation over the last years? I would say that we have not grown our tech stack. We have not grown our technology. We have not even necessarily grown the capabilities that we were using within the technology. The focus of our growth has been in the people and the processes. And if you have technology underneath you already that can support the growth, like Marketo, you're fine. You don't need to worry about plugging things into it. You don't need to worry about unlocking new features and new capabilities. The focus of the growth is the people and the process and the strategy to your point. You don't have to wait for a seat at the table until you can tie revenue numbers to marketing get the seat at the table when you can in any time that you can and start growing from there start planting the seed of of what marketing can do what marketing automation can do in any capacity in any conversation and it will start to naturally grow on its own awesome awesome well thank you melissa i know that you know clearly you have a passion for you know what you're doing with marketing automation and kind of helping other digital markers kind of understand the value and, and how they could you know really be change agents for for their organization. So thank you for getting on the the call today. Um, you shared a lot of great you know kind of anecdotes and and pieces of information. I think just your story. It's so important to have other people here. Like I've ex I'm experiencing some of these same things things too where I have. And so you know don't be shocked when those things come up. Um, for anybody who is on the line and has any additional questions, you can email those out to info at leadus.com and we'll be sure that they get to, you know, Melissa or Cindy or myself, depending upon what the question is. Um, we thank everybody again for being on the call today and we hope that you have a wonderful afternoon and great Memorial weekend.